ESPN celebrating 150 years of college football. It's the football battle of the century. What is a game of a century? To me, it has to be for all the marbles. You got to be playing for something here. A game to decide who is number one. You want a game of the century? He's all the way home! Put some chips on the table. Then you get yourself a game of the century. If nothing is at stake, it's a good football game. That's about it. It has to have the anticipation of a showdown. An ugly few moments down there on the end zone. We call things like Game of the Century because that's a reflection of our own excitement. Herschel catches the ball! So, of course, we jack up the hype. The most anticipated college game in a long, long time, the USC in Texas. Of course, you don't want to get there, and you hype it up all week, or you hype it up for three weeks, and it's not good. You need a great game. He's going for the Presented by Cintas. The game of the century label is subjective. There are certain games that have gone down to the wire over the history of college football that you could certainly deem them. Incomplete! The Buckeyes win! Nobody was calling the Fiesta Bowl Ohio State Miami game any game of the century. It turned out to have a lot of drama. It turned out to be a great game. It wasn't really expected to be like hyped up that way. A game of the century has to have certain elements. It can't just be a great finish. 56 yarder. The kick six game between Auburn and Alabama, 109 yard return. Auburn's gonna win the football game! It was significant. It cost Alabama a national championship, and Auburn ended up playing 4 1, but they didn't win. I think you have to delineate significance versus Flutie curling the winner. That didn't end up with Boston College carrying a trophy. Caught by Boston College! I don't believe it! Before you have even the BCS, the game of the century is any time people feel like they can get a referendum on who's the best. And if so if you got one versus two, or maybe even one versus three, I think that is definitely a requirement. But tomorrow there will be a game which may very well decide this year's national championship. So when it did happen, of course all the newspaper guys were like, we gotta hype the hell out of this thing. And you would call it the game of the century. And then the next one would come along and they were like, this seems like the game of the century. Nobody remember we called the last one the game of the century. Back in the goal, and Arkansas lead. The term game of the century is not thrown about willy-nilly. There have only been a handful, and that phrase has only been used in the history of college football. That's kind of cool. Harvard and Yale played a huge game that in 1909. They were both undefeated, and it was called something like the Battle of the Beasts. You know, that one didn't really last very long. But Game of the Century has some oomph to it. The earliest I've seen it used was in 1935. Obviously, there were monumental games played before Ohio State and Notre Dame did. It doesn't mean that those earlier games weren't important and critical and somebody didn't win a national championship, but the Game of the Century idea never dawned on anyone. The vast Ohio Stadium at Columbus, 81,000 strong, drawn to the clash between the two mighty football machines of Notre Dame and Ohio State, both untied and undefeated. The 1935 Notre Dame-Ohio State game was the first so-called game of the century. You know, this was during the Depression. Closing time, the close of an era. College football during the Depression was no different than the rest of American society. It took a huge hit. Salaries plummeted. People didn't have the money to spend on football. But for that game, it didn't matter. And it was a sellout. Watch them pouring in. Old folks, young folks, students, office girls, college girls, businessmen, and housewives. This is the first time they'd ever played. And so when they finally got together, it was like, boom. Game of the century. On the ship, Bladen fades back, 
But Ohio forwards charging in, hurry the toss, which is long, high, and intercepted by Antonucci, who laterals to Boucher. Boucher of Ohio is free, goes streaking down the sidelines, narrowly missing the rival of safety man, as he goes over the goal line for Ohio State. Ohio State held Notre Dame to two first downs in the first half, and so at halftime, they're leading 13 to nothing. Notre Dame lines up the ship, a single wing back to the right, and Miller, plunging fullback, crashes the line, rips the hole through right guard and goes over for a touchdown. Notre Dame scores early in the fourth quarter. It set up the last five minutes, which were just a frantic display of offensive football by Notre Dame. Hilney fading back with deadly aim. Layton has it, he's free and over the goal line. Notre Dame scores again. They miss the extra point. All Ohio State has to do is get the ball back and run out the clock. But they turn it over, and here comes Notre Dame. Notre Dame quickly lines up. Here's the play, Pilney. Starting on a fake reverse, slashes off right tackle, sheds Ohio secondaries, boxed in, stumbles, fights his way until thrown outside. And Andy Pilney, who ran the Irish offense, makes this great run. But he blows his knee out at the end of the run. A teammate had jumped on his back and tore his ACL. And back then, an ACL injury was the end of your career. It was the last play you ever played at Notre Dame. Another substitution for the Irish. McKenna goes in for Gilbert as quarterback. You have the guy with the name William Shakespeare. Shakespeare enters the game for Notre Dame. Notre Dame lines up in Ohio's 19-yard line. Shakespeare replacing Pilney. He's a pass toward the end zone. Milner's got it, and Notre Dame wins the ball game. The game of the century. The reason that one was. Notre Dame came back to win the game 18 to 13, and it was a miracle game and created a lot of national attention. Notre Dame's Legion begins to crowd the bands off the field in a wild charge at the goalpost. And listen now to the roar of the throng reverberating throughout the Mammoth Stadium. There are games that happened in the first half of the last century that took the sport and propelled it forward. Notre Dame Army is a greatly significant game. Army has some tasted victory over Notre Dame for 13 long years. One of the reasons Army was so good at the time was most of their players were in officer training school and didn't have to go fight. Notre Dame's players were all gone, serving overseas. One of the greatest teams of all time. When the smoke clears, it's Army 48, Notre Dame nothing. Army for two years just puts a pasting on Notre Dame which leads us to 1946 and an incredible matchup. It's the football battle of the century and 74,000 fans spin the turnstiles to jam every seat in Yankee Stadium. Notre Dame had been the dominant team before the war and Army had been the dominant team during the war and now we're gonna find out who's the dominant team of the post-war era. Clash of the Titans, Army versus Notre Dame was the end all be all. We forget because we know the NFL is this monolith. And we know the NFL is the number one brand in America. Not back then it wasn't. It was the biggest event you could possibly have outside of Joe Lewis fighting for the heavyweight title. This was probably the most publicized game in the history of college football. It was greatly significant in the role that college football played in our country. And the big crowd gets set for a game they'll never forget. It's an incredible scene. The ticket prices, the scalpers were going 200 plus for tickets in 1946. Think about that. Blanchard Davis and Company, unbeaten in 25 games, pride of the Army. Here's the Kelly Queen opposition. The tough Irish Terriers are loaded for mule today. Nothing defines a great game like a star power. In that game, you had three Heisman Trophy winners play, plus a fourth one sitting on the bench. There was two from Army, Doc Blanchard, Glenn Davis, Mr. Outside, Mr. Inside, and then on the other side was Leon Hart and Johnny Lujak. How often do you get that? That's pretty cool. And here we go. From the very start, it's a battle of gridiron giants. Tucker and Davis get the Army juggernaut rolling, but then the Irish present a stonewall front to Doc Blanchard, and the cadets lose the ball on down. Now, 
Notre Dame had one or two scoring chances and hit a fourth down and two situation. Did not attempt the field goal. Notre Dame sends Bill Gompers flying around in, but he doesn't make it. And Army saves the day, driving Gompers out on the three-yard line, and it's Army's ball. Leahy refused to kick field goals. He thought they were beneath Notre Dame. Second half, and the score is still nothing to nothing. Doug Blanchard carries, breaks into the open, but Lou Jack speeds in from the side with a game-saving tackle. Doc Blanchard bursts through Notre Dame secondary. Johnny Lou Jack ends up making the most famous tackle in Notre Dame history, brings him down at Notre Dame's 36-yard line when there's nobody behind him, and that's probably the only really scoring threat Army had in the game. And here's the last play. Tucker is still in there fighting, but it's all over. Army's winning streak has ended, so is Notre Dame's. Young people today would probably find the Notre Dame Army game boring. It was anticlimactic, but it's one of the games people are still talking about so many years later. But 74,000 fans saw the football battle of the century. at the games of the century, they all seem to involve Notre Dame. Why is that? There's a couple of reasons. One, Notre Dame has very good teams. Four horsemen running wild. Look at him go! 94 yards and a Notre Dame touchdown. Secondly, they would play a very competitive schedule against other great teams throughout the nation. Notre Dame, Michigan State. The most anticipated football game of the decade has finally arrived. So in 1966, Notre Dame plays Michigan State in the game of the century, and it doesn't air nationally. Because back then, the NCAA set up these rules that you could only be on national TV twice a year. So if you're watching in Southern California or in Texas, the announcers during that game would tell you the Notre Dame-Michigan State game is going to be aired on tape delay later today. For those of you interested in watching it, look away. We are going to flash you a current score of the game. I know it's hard to believe that now, but that's how college football television was. In the end, ABC ended up blacking out the game, and North Dakota, South Dakota called it a regional game and broadcast it to Hawaii and even over to Vietnam for the first time. This game between the Fighting Irish and the Spartans of Michigan State must certainly rank as a great one for football fans. We're so pleased that so many of you are having an opportunity to see this battle between the unbeatens, the number one and the number two teams in the country. It'll decide the national championship. They had to do some finagling to get it on the air. So this was a huge game. And so there's enormous anticipation. And then all this wacky stuff happened. Nick Eddy, who was the top running back for Notre Dame, fell as he was getting off the train in East Lansing and hurt his shoulder and didn't play. Then the game starts and Terry Hanratty hurts his shoulder. Bubba Smith tackles him and he can't play. Bubba Smith, number 95, and look at the size, 6'8", 290 pounds. There's the snap, Cavender gets the ball, touchdown, over right tackle! What puts a real game of the century over the top is when it's got greater meaning or context maybe even beyond football. Michigan State coach Duffy Darty, you know, he's got 20 African-American players, and he's got Jimmy Ray as an African-American quarterback. Jimmy Ray. There's not one singular thing that you can point to that says, hey, college football is integrated. But what Duffy Darty did with that 1966 team. What a game. It's a tremendous part of the evolution of race in college football. Come Dick Kenny. Kicks with a bare right foot. It's got the distance. Michigan State 10, Notre Dame nothing. Notre Dame kicked a 42-yard field goal to tie it at 10 in the fourth quarter. Michigan State punted back to Notre Dame with a minute and a half left. Do both teams want this ball game? Oops. Notre Dame, Tom Shane recovers his own fumble. 
Wow. Score tied. Here's Coley O'Brien. In like the last minute or so, I don't think Coley O'Brien threw a pass. Notre Dame lines up in an eye, and the linemen are in punch. There they go, trying for the first down, and they get it. Game goes in in the tie, Chris. It's one of those contests that makes you feel he ought to have an extra period in college football. Irish coach Eric Barsegan elected to run the ball up the middle six straight times, and the Michigan State crowd was booing mercifully. And it looks like that's all Martin Stadium. The game ended in an unresolved finish. This game of the century did not have a winner. Can you imagine if that happened now? Kenny had kicked the 47 yard field goal earlier. We were placed in a very difficult position. Our field position was such that an error on our part would have given Kinney an opportunity to kick a field goal to beat us. Uh, we were not going to give him that opportunity. There was a decision that ended up paying off for Notre Dame. The next week they beat Southern Cal, 51 nothing. Notre Dame was voted number one in the final AP poll, was declared national champion. But that game between Michigan State and Notre Dame, the fact that Eric Parsegian didn't play for the win, the vibe of that decision would never sit right. And every coach after that, faced with that decision to tie or to go for the win, would always go for the win. So that game of the century was enormously influential on the future of college football. You could debate the merits of a tie game with Army or a tie game with Michigan State being games of the century, but the 1988 Miami-Notre Dame game in South Bend warrants any and all inclusion on lists of games of the century. My teammates that were seniors in the 1988 season had gone down to Miami in 1985 and got beat down. When we embarrassed them in Miami and beat them 58 to 7, they got their program back up to where they could compete with us. Notre Dame fans began to mark on their calendar October 15, 1988. The game of the year takes place tomorrow in South Bend, Indiana, where the top ranked Miami Hurricanes visit number four Notre Dame. They wanted revenge at home, there's no doubt. Hatched in some dorm room conversations comes this t shirt. Catholics versus convicts, and it caught on like wildfire. It captured from the Notre Dame fan perspective how people felt about the rivalry. The tradition of Notre Dame versus, as Brent Musburger says, the nouveau riche of college football. Two eras are about to clash. Inside the stadium, it's the toughest ticket in sport this weekend. Miami to win back-to-back -back national championships needs this one. Notre Dame to get back to the top, they have to beat the Hurricanes. You also know that there have been hostilities between these two schools. And I just remember we were doing our pregame ritual under the goalposts, and a rumble essentially broke out. An ugly few moments down there in the end zone. It was on a level where a bully is in town, and you know he's going to bully you, and it's like your mindset is, I don't care if he beats me down, I'm not backing down. One of the things that was incredible about that game was that Notre Dame was back in the picture. You forget that Notre Dame had been really downtrodden for a while, and they had really become a kind of a bit of a joke for a little while, and so to have them back was important. Walsh's pass is deflected, intercepted. Terrell will go the distance. The perception was Miami's number one, long winning streak. Once that game got going, the Irish went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Canes, and it was clear early on that this was going to be a game for the ages. Cleveland Gary for the touchdown. It was sort of the ultimate showdown. The game sort of embodied the best of what a regular season game could be, at least the most hype it could generate. The game was just epic. It had drama, it had controversy. Fourth down and everything. Notre Dame ball. They have fumbled at the one yard line. Jimmy Johnson furious. And 
an official called a fumble down the goal line, but we didn't have instant replay. Had we had instant replay, we would have beaten them again and won another national championship, had another undefeated season. And the ball came loose before he went down. That's a good call by the official. That's one of those plays that lives in Notre Dame lore. And it was an incredible finish. It's 31 to 24. Notre Dame and this fourth down coming up for Miami. Wouldn't it be something if it came down to the two point conversion? Touchdown, Andre Brown. Now they'll go for two, I believe. storybook it's like a movie especially if you like happy endings and you're a Notre Dame fan the 88 game propelled them to the national championship they haven't won one since people would love a story you have to have your good guys with the white hats you know and you have to have your bad guys with the black hats and they got all of that in that game the final countdown has begun to college football's game of the year. The Fighting Irish of Notre Dame battle the Florida State Seminoles. A few years later, oh. here's Notre Dame again right at the center of a game of the century. It's only in college football that we circle the dates the way we do. A game of the century builds up for weeks and months. How many times have games of the century come and gone? It's worth the wait if you can come up with a game like Notre Dame, Florida State, there's just this sort of drumbeat that the college football ear can hear. And when that week gets here. You're the first one here? He's here on Tuesday. Yeah, I've been here since 1 o'clock Wednesday. You're just so excited for it. And that 93 Florida State at Notre Dame game had everything. National championship implications in South Bend, Bowden, Holtz, South, North. The number one team in the country, the Seminoles. The number two team in the country, Notre Dame. With college football, and when it was strictly the polls, you didn't get a ton of one versus two matchups. So when they did come along, it was a big deal. And he is nailed, Derek Brooks. 93, Florida State was one of the best college teams I'd ever seen. You got guys like Derek Brooks on defense an all-pro Charlie Ward's a Heisman Trophy quarterback coach Bowden and Brad Scott his offensive coordinator were running the up-tempo no huddle offense for the first time with the fastest guys in college football I thought they could win a division in the NFL That's complete right side. Touchdown, but coach Holtz had a way of pulling the upset And Notre Dame is killing them. They have scored in the ball game off of this alignment, and they're going to do it again. This is ridiculous how good they are. But never give up on Charlie Ward and a fast-paced offense. It is fourth down and goal to go. 20 yards. It turned out Notre Dame only stayed number one for a week. They lost the next week to Boston College, and Florida State won the national championship. But the Notre Dame-Florida State game stands the test of time as a game of the century because of the buildup, because of the game, and because we're still talking about it. Those are the three conditions, to me, that make up a game of the century, whether Notre Dame's in it or not.
October 15, the first moratorium against the war turned out huge crowds in cities all across the nation. 1969 was a time in society where so many things were changing socially. You had the Vietnam War. There were protests everywhere. There was integration taking place in society and in the world of athletics. But then Texas, Arkansas, the one versus two matchup. Last game of the season, both rosters were all white. That'll set it up from number one in the country, perhaps. Texas, Arkansas on ABC, December 6th. Right. That game, it's a turning point. It winds up being the very last, effectively, national championship game played between two all-white teams. On the 100th anniversary of college football, ABC Sports presents... In today's game, the top-ranked Longhorns of Texas meet the unbeaten Razorbacks of Arkansas. This game is going to happen, and President Nixon decides that he is going to come. The election that had just recently happened, George Wallace, the segregationist, ended up carrying several southern states. After Nixon's elected, Nixon's team is looking for ways to appeal to southern whites. We're going to see today one of the great football games of all time. So Nixon, as part of his southern strategy, says, oh, Good, I'm gonna go to this marquee matchup. And it is huge. And this was an incredibly useful political tool for Nixon. Well, we're moments away now from a renewal of a great rivalry, Texas-Arkansas. Texas, number one in the nation, undefeated 18 games. Arkansas, undefeated in 15 games. Before that game, crucially, Michigan plays Ohio State. And Ohio State, number one, they've not lost in, since 67, for crying out loud. They're supposed to be the best team ever in college football. Michigan somehow pulls off the upset, and Texas knows this going into this game. ABC had moved Arkansas and Texas from the middle of the season to the first weekend in December, and then crossed their fingers. And lo and behold, at the end of the season, Texas and Arkansas are suddenly at the top of the polls. Arkansas leads, underdog Arkansas, seven, Texas, nothing. Arkansas, Bill Montgomery, a great throwing quarterback, and Chuck Dykus, All-American receiver on one side. Dykus, touchdown. You got Texas at Coach Royal's new wishbone on the other side, and you've got James Street, who is the quarterback, and he's a little bitty guy, but a feisty guy, and just led the great comeback. Now second and nine for Texas, start of the fourth quarter. Street gets a hard Arkansas rush, he dives it to the 45, the Arkansas 40, breaks the tackle to the 35, goes to 30, to 25, to the 20, to the 15, to the 10, to the 5, and over for a Texas touchdown. They score with about 14 minutes left and go for two. And Street. Just made eight points. We get late in the game, and Texas coach Darrell Royal realizes he's got to flip this game on Arkansas. So the Longhorns have to move 64 yards in order to get on the scoreboard and into the lead. He's on the 43-yard line. It's the fourth quarter, fourth and three. He calls for a deep pass out of the wishbone. And going to go to Randy Peschel, and Peschel catches the ball. And all of a sudden, the entire tenor of the afternoon changed. And that one play is iconic in Texas history for a really good reason. Touchdown. 14 to 14 from the point after, or two coming up. This is a big one. It's up. for the first time with three minutes and 58 seconds left in the game. They have the lead by one. Of course, if Arkansas is able to drive down the field and kick the field goal, they win the game. A minute 22 to go. Here is Bill Montgomery. Texas has come up with a big play.
team to be behind 14 to nothing and then not to lose its cool and to go on to win. That proves you deserve to be number one, and that's what you are. Yeah. The power of that one versus two matchup began to exert itself not only in print, but on television as well. And then we saw it again in 1971 with Oklahoma and Nebraska. Tomorrow there will be a game which may very well decide this year's national championship. We had Nebraska coming off a championship. They were unbeaten in 29 games. They had a 20-game winning streak. Oklahoma, early in the season, had beaten some really good opponents and pummeled them pretty good. And now all of a sudden, the two rivals were on a collision course. That game had the largest television rating in the history of college football on a Thanksgiving day in which there were NFL games, too. Today, it's the showcase of college football as we look at the number one ranked team in the nation in the white jerseys, the Cornhuskers from Nebraska, being intercepted by the Sooners of Oklahoma. They are ranked number two. The game to decide who is number one. Nebraska had a great football team. They were undefeated, we were undefeated. We weren't a great defensive team then, as we will, were the next several years. Oklahoma is the nation's top offensive team. Nebraska is the nation's top defensive team. As they say, something has got to give. Here's Wiley's kick. It's high. Rodgers takes the ball at the 30. He's hit and got away. Back up field to the 35, to the 40. He's to the 45. He's to the 50, to the 45, to the 40, to the 35, to the 20, to the 10. He's all the way home. Holy moly. Man, woman, and child did that. Put him in the aisle. Johnny the Jet Rodgers just tore him loose from their shoes. Johnny Rogers had this magnificent punt return. They still had a whole game to play. And in order for Oklahoma to win today, their offense has to keep trying to puncture the Nebraska defense. There it is. Just waltzes in. Jack Milgram of the Sooners. We played a good game offensively. Milton had 300 yards rushing and throwing. And there is a touchdown, Oklahoma, John Harrison. Fourth down and six for Oklahoma with seven minutes, 14 seconds to go. Nebraska leading 28-24. Milton busting one out here to a man who's open. It's a touchdown, Oklahoma lead. And now the clock. 5.15 to go. Plenty of time for Nebraska, but if they do score, it'll be awfully short time for the Oklahoma offense. Well, the coach of Nebraska was Bob Devaney, a Hall of Fame coach. We asked him, what did you say to quarterback Jerry Taggy when you sent him out there on this last drive, expecting he would say something profound? He said, I told him to keep giving the ball to Kenny. If you get in trouble, throw it to Rodgers. Kenny carried it nine times, and he threw it twice to Rodgers. Nebraska trailing by three, third and goal from the two. What pressure on the Oklahoma defense. Not to be denied, Jeff Kenney, his third touchdown of the afternoon. All right, this is it, fellas. This is it. Let's go. A four-point lead by Nebraska. Last time Oklahoma was defeated, 28 to 21 last year by Nebraska. And game Chris has come down to one snap the season has come down to one snap for both of these teams so here it is fourth down and 14 Milgren looking the ball knocked down by Glover and Nebraska takes over the ball one minute ten seconds left on the clock and I am going out of my board so many times in sports you build something up it doesn't measure up and this was a case where the game did measure up and then some biggest college football game of the year, if not decade, is taking place here tomorrow. Are the Hurricanes going to win big? Big! 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 big? There's so much we take for granted about college football now that really started with Penn State and Miami and the Fiesta Bowl in January of 1987. We accept to play Penn State in the Fiesta Bowl. It was a manufactured one versus two matchup. 
NBC and the Fiesta Bowl had the idea, if we move this game off of January 1st and put it on January 2nd, we'll get a bigger audience. Miami Vice and Crime Story will not be seen tonight so that we may bring you NBC Sports special presentation of the Fiesta Bowl. The NBC was willing to boot Miami Vice, one of the highest rated shows in television, off. This is how big the Penn State-Miami matchup appeared to be. The Hurricanes arrived dressed to kill. Did the Japanese go and sit down and have dinner with Pearl Harbor and Cody Bonga? No! Well, fellas, let's go. Everybody had feelings about Miami, love or hate. And Penn State represented the Blue Bloods of college football as big underdogs being given no chance to win the game. I don't think there's anything wrong with people think, some people thinking they may be better than we are. The Nittany Lions are not short on respect where they live. In the coal towns and steel mills, the people see this team as a reflection of themselves, as one with a blue collar under its shoulder pads. When it comes right down to it, the players on Penn State weren't necessarily that different than the players on Miami or Michigan or Alabama. People might not believe that, but in the media, we love to portray this as good versus evil, and that's certainly the way that game was presented, helped build the hype. We're just moments away from a meeting between two 11-0 teams ranked first and second in the country, and even dozen victories will make one of them the national champion. University of Miami in 86 was probably the most talented team I'd ever been around. And Testaverde's first pass is on target to Michael Irvin, and Irvin has the first down. We were a very aggressive offense. Jimmy Johnson, not only confidence in his offense, but I think confidence in his defense. We were a very aggressive, very fast defense. And played very beautifully by the Miami defense, Rod Carter, the linebacker. We wanted to attack. That was our philosophy. And it is Bratton over the top. It is a touchdown. It was not three yards and a cloud of dust. We were throwing the ball all over the field. But we were so overconfident, so cocky. We fumbled the ball, we threw interceptions, we turned it over, you know, seven or eight times. A long layover at the end of the season. Now the two teams with a half underway. Let's see if they can turn loose here. The way the game unfolded was incredible. Vinny Testaverde had won a Heisman Trophy and just didn't perform. Throws it's intercepted. The Penn State defense just played lights out. Just a birdie throws, and it is intercepted. Penn State was hanging in there by creating turnovers. Didn't really do a whole lot on offense. Four interceptions for Penn State. It wasn't a scintillating game. Wasn't much scoring. And it's Dozier. Dozier scores. The miscues of Miami, here they are, six turnovers, one missed field goal, five drop passes. They allowed three sacks, penalized eight times. And they trail by four, 14 to 10. And, of course, that's just one play away from the arm of Vinny Testaverde. Don't forget that. Intercepted Giftopoulos! Pete Giftopoulos has a place in the history of the sport by making a clinching interception of Testaverde to seal the victory for Penn State. Worst game I ever coached. Most devastating loss I've ever been around in my life. You know, Miami is one of those universities that you love to hate. I can't say that I didn't sleep well that night when they when they lost that game, no doubt about it. The Penn State Nittany Lions are the national champion. Game of the century to me is the most overused cliche with college football. I can think of maybe one time in my 25 years of covering college football where a game that was overhyped to the gills actually lived up to that. And to me, that was the Rose Bowl game at USC in Texas. It was the 2005 season, and USC had been on a 34-game win streak Winning off the bush push against Notre Dame. Liner going to try to sneak it ahead. He got in. Touchdown, SC! And then you had Texas, which, when it's rolling, is one of the more iconic college football programs there is, led by a guy who, for my money, is the best college quarterback of all time, Vince Young, who had been snubbed in the Heisman. Heading to the end zone. Nobody there. Touchdown, Vince Young. 
So you put those two teams, number one versus number two, the game has all this feel of like a very big Hollywood event. At least our mascot represents our great state. Southern California Trojans. Hello. Yeah! USC was the best. Pete and the boys had an unbelievable three seasons. Back-to-back -back championships. I mean, you just want to play the best. That's just how it is. You want to see how you match up. <laughs> Most anticipated college game in a long, long time. The USC in Texas. The hype going into that game was unbelievable hype. If it lives up to half the hype, it'll be very special. expression at this point is we're gonna play football Yippee. that 2006 rose bowl is the best game i've ever been at i think it's the best game i've ever seen because of two heisman trophy winners vince young celebrities on the sideline Took him, baby. and the talent on the field and it was a lot of highs and lows of that game. Not able to stop Glendale White. I don't think we still stopped him if we was playing right now. <laughs> Texas did not score in that first quarter, and that's the first time this entire season that they've been shut out in the first quarter. Everybody was talking about USC and nobody else. So we had respect. People knew we were really good, but nobody thought we were going to win the game. So the Longhorns have exploded in the last 10 minutes of the second quarter. At halftime, we said we're ahead 16 to 10. What a game. Isn't this fun? You got 30 minutes to win a national championship. 30 minutes, and you got a six-point lead. Matt Liner came to the party the second half, throwing the mess out of the ball. And then Lindell was doing his thing the whole game. You need a little bit of a perfect storm to have a game of the century. You need to have, obviously, both teams ranked very highly. Number two, you need some superstars. Reaches for it. Touchdown. Third lead change of the ball game. If it can go back and forth, you know, that would be great. If it looks like one team's gonna pull away, then uh-oh, here they come back, and all of a sudden it goes into the fourth quarter. Oh my gosh, everybody's sitting on the edge of their seat and can hardly breathe. Oh, it's around the corner! Touchdown! And he tiptoed down the sideline and flipped in the end zone. Like, okay, that's the Reggie we know. I'm not sure these officials from the Big Ten have ever seen anybody fly through the air like Reggie Bush can. We was like, okay, here we go. We're in a dog race. Biggest thing, you got to score. Once they go down and score, you got to hit them back with one as well. And it's good. USC by five. Garrett. Touchdown. USC in the second half has been unstoppable. So a 12-point lead at 6.42, the 34-game win streak is still alive and uh, looking pretty good right now. Young's look for the look coming back, there's daylight, here he goes, touchdown! I've never seen anybody like him in my life. Oh, hold on. I just had to take over the game now, you know, try to keep matting him off the field. Fourth and one now for the Trojans. He didn't get it. Texas football. We've got a minute and 20 seconds to play in a ball game and a five-point USC lead. We were at a good viewing party. You know, the final minutes were happening, and I just remember Brent Musburger is on top of a table screaming, Come on, baby! Let's go! Just wide open. Inside the 20 at the 14. The last play of the game is just butterflies, man. You hear the play, the game on the line, and you gotta like step into that huddle with confidence in your eyes so then your teammates look into your eyes like, okay, Vince feeling good, let's go. Fourth and five, the national championship on the line right here. He's going for the corner. 
just getting into the end zone, man, it was just a memorable moment that me and my teammates and fans going to cherish for the rest of our lives. Vince Young scores. It was absolutely fitting that the final game that Keith Jackson, the voice of college football, covered was that game. No script writer in the history of Hollywood will ever write a better script than that Rose Bowl. times there's negative things that are said publicly about college football teams and coaches but after that game Pete comes over and grabs me and says hey you never want to lose especially a national championship game but if you're gonna lose you need to lose to a champion and you have a great football team in Texas as champion so congratulations that night I didn't go to sleep it was six in the morning President Bush called he loves the Longhorns and he said coach congratulations then I said mr. president you go to bed really early it's been documented all over the place. You go to bed at 9 o'clock. This game wasn't over till really late at night. Now, are you going to tell me you stayed up and watched it? He said, well, I'm going to be honest with you, Coach. With 6 minutes and 42 seconds left, when you were down by 12, I went to bed. And he said, I couldn't sleep. I started rolling around, so I got up. I went back to my TV room, sat in there by myself, and I watched the last three minutes, and I watched Texas win the national championship. So congratulations. young men that's the last real game of the century right and that was two teams going against each other in a bowl game and the winner would be the national champion and that game lived up to every possible expectation from now on to really be a game of the century be as good and as hyped as usc texas and then we can talk invincible the fact that we've only used game of the century on a handful of games, even since Notre Dame and Ohio State, throughout nearly a century, speaks to the uniqueness of those games themselves. Stories that we keep retelling. We are so proud to bring you the championship game, year four of the playoff era. Because we have this playoff set up now, it would be hard to imagine a game of a century taking place during a season because we're going to be able to find a way to have a national champion. The Tigers reclaim their crown. The playoff is going to diminish its usage. There's something about the finality of a game of the century and what was at stake that I think the playoff has taken away from. Has that term gotten to its sell-by date yet? As long as you have people sitting behind microphones or sitting in front of cameras. As long as you have people giving opinions, there will be games in the century. If people are still talking about it for years to come, there you go, game of the century.